in the 1970s, at a, mo a moment of capitalist crisis, when perhaps a new political movement with more ambitious movement culture might have changed things, political allies uh, and enemies of unions began to remove their support for the union movement. 1978, the Carter administration uh, badly botched a labor reform bill that would have made it easier to organize. And then after 1980, uh, the Reagan administration um, systematically stripped uh, federal protections for union organizing um, and started a process of decline in private sector unionism that has not stopped uh, to this day. At the same time, Republicans started appealing to the forces of capitalist aspirations that unions had sort of held in check uh, in the middle of the 20th century and offered new but old explanations for why those aspirations had been thwarted. Big government, regulation, corrupt union bosses, they added appeals to religion and race. As good union jobs and good not, uh, good, as union jobs and good paying non-union jobs dwindled in the 1980s and afterward, working class white men continued to believe in a self-interested, risk-taking masculinity that's beholden to no one. Here, conservative claims uh, that the promise of capitalism had been thwarted by enemies, domestic and foreign, found fertile ground. It's easier to understand why white workers found this convincing, continue to find it convincing, if we recognize that they already believe in its fundamental premises and core claims. That capitalism will work, that growth will return, and they will benefit. That risk and hard, hard work are the ways to do this. With no strong alternative belief world to challenge this, their expectations have been robust, even without new evidence to support them. So to conclude, if we want to start to understand the politics of rural white working class men today, look at the kind of jobs you, they do. You'll find truck drivers, uh, many of them independent operators, tradesmen and contractors and subcontractors, uh, and also factory workers who covet overtime. My own father works 60 to 80 hours a week uh, precisely to earn the overtime pay. Uh, you might be surprised that the nation's highest rates of entrepreneurship are in rural areas. Uh, places with less than 2,500 residents in 19 and 2010 led the nation with 234 owner-operator businesses per 1,000 residents. And the highest rate by far in the United States is in rural areas with fewer than uh, settlements of fewer than uh, 2,500 residents. Now a lot of that's farming, but even the cell phone rate for non-farm businesses is higher than in big towns or urban areas. Uh, their world is one primarily of physical hazards, the possibility but not guarantee of commensurate rewards. They understand that gamble in racial and gender terms. Uh, to confront those hazards is what it means to them to be a white working class man, an American man in some, some iteration. Uh, what women think about this, frankly we know a lot less. Um, we know women's voting patterns are uh, white working class rural women's voting patterns are less conservative than male counterparts, um, but we don't know much about how they view the social risks of this kind of wide open aggressive masculinity. And so we often pose the question, why do white workers act against their interests? I think the question is wrong. Uh, for many, this is how they see their interests. This is what they believe is true. So often, Donald Trump doesn't start with an ideological point, right? He starts with an alternative reality that he's proposing that you have to buy into for anything else to work. Now, I told you that evangelicals have this long history of challenging secular experts when it comes to the authority of the Bible, theory of evolution, this sort of thing. But for a long time, evangelicals were still really concerned to prove the truth of Christianity through an appeal to evidence out there in the world, what was called what is called natural theology, making the case for God's authority by pointing to evidence that you can access regardless of your metaphysical beliefs. In uh, around the turn of the 20th century, something interesting happens in the intellectual history here. A Dutch theologian named Abraham Kuyper shifted the focus a bit 
away from this project of using evidence out in the world toward really a preoccupation with the foundational assumptions that make a Christian worldview different from any other worldview. So he started to change the terms on which Orthodox Christians argued with non-Christians. And this kind of shift in framework really came into full bloom some years later in the American context um, between the 30s and the 60s, thanks to the work of a couple of key theologians, particularly at Westminster Theological Seminary outside of Philadelphia. And they developed a school of thought known as presuppositionalism, which is a mouthful, but the basic idea is very simple. And that's simply that you've got to recognize the assumptions that frame your worldview. And you can only access reality accurately if proceeding from the correct assumptions. The main one being you accept the truth of the inerrant Bible. Now what this does in the, in the a context of an argument with an opponent you don't agree with is that if you can say that the assumptions of your opponent's worldview are wrong, you don't have to look at any of their evidence. Voila, you can call it fake news. In my last book, I spent a lot of time tracing the influence of this particular theological tradition on a number of the key culture warriors who really helped launch the modern Christian right, who taught modern evangelicals to talk in terms of the Christian worldview versus the secular humanist worldview. So my point is simply that when Donald Trump started to talk in terms of phony news and fake news, he unwittingly capitalized on two generations of evangelical intellectual practice. They were already doing I'm now a guy who's you know, interviewed 120 people about being white, and I'm the way to interview 1,000 people about white. And so what have I learned? How does it relate to this conversation that we've had over, over the last couple of days? And I think we're at this really interesting juncture. And we're at this interesting juncture where white people are having to engage the white narrative. And I think that there's a, there's a number of things that drive It's almost like, I feel like we're kind of at the space where we were 10 years ago with gay marriage, when it was this, it wasn't this fully structured debate yet, but it was starting to be this moment of coming, of coming together and analyzing it, but the debate hadn't been formed yet. So when I, when I interview people, what they're navigating is they're navigating this understanding this this these narratives that on some level they know to be false that the false narrative of American exceptionalism I believe America is an exceptional but it's also the narrative of how we behave to our own uh, to, to our own citizens how we behave around the world, it's not an accurate narrative the way that we portray it. I think the same thing that you were talking about, Molly, this idea that the how they see themselves in the world, they fundamentally know that it's actually not accurate that they're, let's say, under attack. But as soon as you start to open up that box, it creates this huge anxiety because it's not clear where the narrative goes. If you're a black American or a gay American or a Native American, you're moving from oppression to less oppression. You're on this trajectory. If you're a white American, what's the trajectory that you're on? Like, if you believe in deconstructing white supremacy, if you believe in equality, then does that mean that I, I, I need to maintain and bring people up? Do I, how do I actually engage this? How do I engage this in my community? Is it a zero-sum game? Is it a disadditive game? And so when I see in these interviews all the time is this, real confusion and trauma of people trying to either hold on extremely tight or to let go. And I think one of the things that I thought was really interesting is what to Charlottesville. And what really struck me with the Charlottesville images is that we've seen images for years of black people in the street fighting white agencies of power. What we have here is we have white people fighting other white people for control of the white narrative. Essentially, you have Antifa and the white nationalists are kind of similar in their worldview. They're, they have their narrative they're trying to, and they determine that violence is the way they need to protect it or advance it. And it's really, it's really stunning to me 
that they're fighting and killing each other for control of that narrative.